Good afternoon and thank you all for joining us today. My name is Juana Groșanu, I'm the Executive Director of the Sustainability Embassy in Romania and I'm happy to be linked in the discussions today on arguments for sustainable business. For the ones that do not know us yet, um, Sustainability Embassy in Romania is an NGO launched six years ago with the mission to promote and foster the transition to the new economic model, the business, uh, the sustainable business one, where a company can solve social and environmental problems without sacrificing its economic efficiency and profitability. We are the coordinators of the Sustainable Romania Coalition, is the first non-political platform for sustainable development in our country. The coalition was created at the initiative of the Department for Sustainable Development within the Romanian government, as an essential pillar for implementing Romania's national strategy for sustainable development. For this reason, uh, the coalition is officially recognized by the Romanian government as the main dialogue partners on topics relevant for Romania's sustainability journey. The coalition now represents more than 1, 150, 1, 150 organizations. I'm talking about large companies, SMEs and NGOs, all contributing already or wanting to contribute to a more sustainable Romania. We know that uh, navigating the sustainability landscape can be complicated and sometimes even overwhelming. This is the reason why three years ago we decided to launch Sustainability School, um, an online educational program on sustainable management dedicated to all organizations part of the coalition. The program is supported by Coca-Cola HBC Romania, also a member of our community. We created this program based on a need that we have no sustainability school in Romania when managers can learn in a holistic and integrated way how to make the transition from business as usual to sustainable business. So the program helps professionals to connect the dots, to better understand the reality and to uh, have clarity in what means making the transition. Today, sustainability school means 97 webinars, more than one, um, 100 local international speakers, over 3,000 participants in the live sessions, and one platform where we gather all the recordings for an easy and self-paced uh, e-learning experience. As mentioned, we are marking today the third anniversary of our program, and what better way of doing that is than organizing this Open for All webinar, having a special guest, one of the global leaders in sustainable development, ranked among the top three most influential economists alive, Professor Jeffrey D. Sachs. We'll be spending together the next hour. My dialogue with Professor um, Sachs will last for about 30 minutes, and afterward, we'll open the floor for the questions from your side. During our talk, please feel free to put your questions in the chat and I will address them afterwards. Of course, we encourage you to open your mic and camera so we can truly have an interactive uh, Q&A session and not only us to engage in the conversation. Professor Sachs, thank you very much again for accepting our invitation. We are honored. Welcome to Sustainability School and welcome back to Romania. I know you've Thanks. been here. Many, many times uh, and it's very good to be with you. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, looking forward to the discussion and especially to the topics that are on your mind. Uh, what are your priorities? Uh, how do you see things from uh, from the perspective of Romania? And uh, what what are the main challenges that you would like to discuss? We know it's a complex topic. We are going only to scratch the surface today a bit. But anyway, these are important questions that we should address and, and uh, uh, discuss them to have more clarity. Um, I'd like to start the conversation first from a broader perspective, so I think let's set the, let's set the scene first um, and speak about uh, a bit uh, the regulatory landscape that has rapidly evolved uh, over the past, uh, the past 10 years. Um, the ambitions have never been higher, reason why, as mentioned, we have regulatory coming more and more. Uh, today, more than one, 150 countries all over the world mandate voluntarily or mandatory sustainability reports. And Europe, it seems that is again leading the way in sustainability, especially with the CSRD, the new corporate sustainability reporting directive. We are very curious to see if you can share your views on how this influences the global economic landscape. Is sustainability a global project? Can you feel that? Great. So, uh, greetings uh, to everybody. Let me let me give uh, then a little bit of uh, background as as I see it. Uh, 
everybody knows that we are in the ninth year of the sustainable development goals. These were adopted in 2015. Uh, they are a set of 17 overarching goals and uh, uh, 168 uh, targets uh, that are supposed to be achieved by the year uh, 2030. And this is a, a universal program, as you said, uh, all 193 UN member states adopted this. Europe uh, is pursuing it largely through the European Green Deal, uh, which is certainly the most comprehensive set of objectives of any regional grouping in the world. So <clears throat> why do we do this and, and uh, how are we doing? We, we are doing it because uh, we're really in a lot of trouble globally, as uh, I'm sure everybody appreciates. The way that the world economy functions uh, is simply not uh, suitable for human needs. Uh, it fails in several ways. Uh, one dramatic failing, of course, is that some parts of the world remain uh, really stuck in terrible poverty and terrible exclusion and uh, very often uh, that uh, also means uh, huge uh, amounts of uh, instability and conflict as well. Uh, second is our economies uh, uh, all over the world are unfair, unequal, uh, and in many places, including my own country, the United States, becoming uh, more and more unequal over time. Third, of course, is the uh, multiple dimensions of a massive and still growing environmental crisis, possibly a catastrophe. Uh, at least uh, three major environmental crises are, are all interacting. The climate change, uh, which is uh, upon us everywhere uh, with warming uh, of Earth that's already at the 1.5 degrees Celsius limit that was supposed to be the top of the warming, but it, we're going to shoot right through that limit. Uh, second is the catastrophic loss of biodiversity, uh, the destruction of forests, the destruction of wetlands, uh, of coastlines, uh, of uh, and uh, uh, depletion of fresh water uh, that is uh, occurring all over the world. And the third of these environmental crises is the massive pollution of everything, uh, the air, the water, the, uh, the Black Sea, the Mediterranean. Uh, we, we have uh, a massive pollution crisis. Of course, the plastics pollution is well known, but aerosol pollutions, toxic chemicals, you name it. The fourth area of sustainable development, in addition to ending poverty, reducing inequality, addressing the environmental crises, is <laughs> probably the one we're failing on most, uh, and that is peace and cooperation. Uh, which is part of the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, SDG 16 is for peaceful societies, and SDG 17 is for cooperation across countries. I don't have to say to you in Romania, we're, we're in a war that is spreading globally. It's a very, very dangerous and unhappy situation. I think it's more complicated than sometimes is said in our countries. I put a lot of blame on the United States, by the way, uh, for this. We can discuss this. Uh, they don't like me for saying it, but um, I don't think the U.S. is a peace-loving country, uh, and I think it provoked your neighbor, Russia, and uh, it does many other things that are very, very unfortunate. So all of this means that we have a we have a world that doesn't hang together very well. Uh, we are uh, uh, facing poverty in the midst of wealth, high inequality, uh, massive environmental crises, and uh, global geopolitical 
instability. And this is what the Sustainable Development Goals uh, aimed to address, uh, because sustainable development means, at least for me, and I think it's the right interpretation, it means a world in which poverty has been uh, eliminated, uh, in which inequalities are kept reduced, uh, in which the environmental crises are brought under control, uh, and in which uh, there is uh, global peace and cooperation. So those are the overarching objectives of, of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. From a, a business point of view, what does it mean? Uh, I think the main thing that it means is that our societies in principle need to change how they operate uh, and how they interact with each other. Uh, in the network that I lead for the UN called the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, uh, we talk about six big transformations of society. Uh, the first is a learning society where education uh, is available for all throughout the lifetime because we think that quality knowledge and education is central to a better society, to ending poverty, to reducing inequality, and to being able to address the other crises. Second is a health transformation uh, because uh, we have uh, many health challenges, including the, the positive side of uh, an aging uh, society, which is good, longevity, but then addressing those uh, new public health challenges arising from that. Uh, we have new epidemic diseases. We had the pandemic, which is a whole nother subject, um, and so on. The third transformation is the energy transformation. We absolutely need to end the fossil fuel dependence. Fossil fuel, coal, oil, and Natural gas brought us the world modern economy, but it also brought us the human-induced climate change. And so we need the transformation in a systematic way to wind, solar, hydro, geothermal, nuclear, uh, or other zero-carbon technologies. And we need to change how we use energy as well. Uh, no doubt uh, we are moving from the internal combustion engine economy to the electric vehicle and uh, electrified uh, mobility economy. We're moving to a hydrogen-based economy where the hydrogen is produced from uh, zero carbon primary energy sources and so forth. So the energy transformation is the third of these six. The fourth is land use and agriculture. Land use and agriculture change is uh, one of the greatest drivers of environmental unsustainability. Agriculture itself contributes almost a third of all of the greenhouse gas emissions that are warming the planet because agriculture releases carbon dioxide through energy use and through deforestation and land degradation. Uh, agriculture releases methane uh, through uh, cattle uh, and uh, through uh, rice paddies uh, and uh, other parts of the agriculture supply chain. Uh, agriculture releases nitrous oxide through the use of nitrogen-based fertilizers. And so agriculture needs to become sustainable. Uh, it is not. Uh, our food supply and our food system also needs to become much more healthy, at least in the United States. The food industry is poisoning the American people, uh, literally. We're a nation of obesity, metabolic disease, and a lot of that is uh, highly processed foods in the American diet. The fifth transformation is the urban transformation, uh, which maybe for uh, our societies isn't happening so fast, but in developing countries, uh, Urbanization is uh, proceeding at an extraordinarily rapid rate. 5% per year growth of the uh, urban centers 
That means a doubling of urban populations roughly every 12 years uh, or, or 14 years. And this is overwhelming city life uh, in the uh, developing economies. And the sixth of the transformations that we identify is the digital transformation because this is the fastest changing technology in the world. Uh, it should be highly productive. Of course, it's very complicated, the effects that the digital age is having on our economies. It's changing jobs. It's changing psychology. Uh, it's uh, being militarized. Uh, it's being used by government for spying and surveillance, for cyber warfare, for many, many things. So for business, we're going to have a significant change in how business is done. Uh, greener, more digital, uh, with the more attention to uh, sustainable supply chains. Businesses in Europe are going to be or are a lot more responsible for knowing where their products come from and how their products are used. So we have all these major targets. We have globally agreed goals. Uh, we have the European Green Deal as an inspiration. We have uh, the kinds of changes that we need to make uh, in how business and economy operates. And then the question is how we're doing. And the answer is lousy. Uh, we're just not doing well. We set this big agenda, uh, this uh, complicated uh, set of objectives. And I would say the progress is far too slow and in many cases non-existent. In many cases, we're going backwards rather than forward. So this is my life at, at the UN, which is uh, big goals, big objectives, very little achievement, and the years go on. And unfortunately, we not only lose time, but we actually uh, lose the chance to meet the objectives that we've set because objectives such as keeping the warming of the Earth to below 1.5 degrees Celsius disappears. We, we just exceed the targets uh, that we've set. Uh, or we lose the chance to save endangered ecosystems uh, or to stop uh, uh, reaching tipping points where uh, our ecosystems uh, stop functioning properly or species are driven to extinction. So we're, we're running out of time. Unfortunately, we are also not with the attention span that we need. I'll say that uh, five years ago when Europe announced the European Green Deal, I said, wonderful, uh, this is uh, path breaking. We'll now use the European Green Deal as a framework. We'll take it around the world. Uh, we'll go to ASEAN for an ASEAN Green Deal. We'll go to South America for a South American Green Deal. Uh, go to Africa for an African Green Deal. But it didn't happen. The main reason it didn't happen is Europe got diverted uh, to war. Uh, most of the attention in Europe every day is about the war in Ukraine. Uh, now we have uh, the war in Gaza. We seem absolutely incapable of addressing any issue uh, because our attention span is so short and our predilection for conflict is so high. And this is very, very troubling. Uh, why are we at war in Ukraine? Uh, let me just say one uh, sentence about that or one paragraph. Uh, we are at war in Ukraine because the United States had the bad idea of expanding NATO to Ukraine. You know, when uh, the U.S. wanted to expand NATO uh, in the 1990s, uh, the Russians said, but you promised us there wouldn't be NATO. Uh, you promised us that when the Warsaw Pact ended, uh, NATO wouldn't take advantage of us. But then you started expanding NATO. And uh, NATO went first to Poland, Hungary, and Czech Republic, contrary to what had been promised to Gorbachev and to Yeltsin. And the Russians complained. Then in 2004, NATO went to Romania, Bulgaria, 
uh, Slovenia, Slovakia, Estonia, Lithuania, and Latvia. And the Russians said, what the hell are you doing? You told us it wouldn't move. Now you're on the Black Sea. Now you're in the Baltics. Uh, now you're in the Balkans. You're surrounding us. Don't come any closer. Uh, and then the United States, which is truly a stupid country, I have to tell you, stupid government. Uh, I could say the country is not as stupid as our government, but our government is really arrogant. They said, well, now we move to Ukraine and to Georgia. To my mind, this makes no sense at all. Uh, Romania arguably is a North Atlantic country, arguably, uh, but Georgia is not a North Atlantic country. Georgia is an Eastern uh, Black Sea uh, Caucasus country. Uh, and uh, it has no business in NATO, but but the uh, the NATO planners wanted to surround Russia in the Black Sea, uh, so they wanted Ukraine, Romania, Bulgaria, Turkey, and Georgia to surround Russia, so that Russia would cease to be a big power. They thought, well, the Russians said, no, we're not going to be surrounded in the Black Sea by the United States military. We don't accept that. We don't accept missiles on Ukrainian territory. And then the last 10 years have been terrible. Yeah. Uh, so just to say all of this, I, I want to say this because I know in Romania, this is not the major way the story is told, but uh, it, but it is, I need to say it because I want you to understand why we're not achieving sustainable development because you cannot achieve sustainable development in a war. It's yeah. not possible. So again, I see in the chat, people are unhappy about this discussion, but I need to tell you, because I deal with this every day for the last 20 years, if we're at war, there's no sustainable development. Uh, and Europe has lost the European Green Deal. Uh, it's gonna go to the right wing in this parliament uh, there's a backlash against sustainability uh, because Europe is uh, focused on war and instability and not focused on peace and sustainable development. So I, I have to say this just so I'm understood uh, because yeah. I believe that without that peaceful cooperation, we're not going to be able to achieve anything we've set out to achieve. So just to conclude, a couple of points. Uh, first, um, we're not right now on track to achieve these goals. It doesn't make them less important. Actually, they're becoming more urgent. The environmental crises are worse this year than they have been ever before. The damages are everywhere. Everywhere you look in the world, there are floods, there are droughts, there are heat waves. Uh, we, we have record-breaking temperatures all over the world right now. Last year was the hottest year in uh, human history, uh, in civilized history, the last 10,000 years. So this agenda is not becoming less important. It's just not being achieved. This is the first point. Second, there will be a summit of the future uh, at the UN in September, which aims to address the longer term issues of how we get along with each other uh, and how we make multilateralism work. I'm hoping that something useful can come out of this. Third, Europe will have elections uh, within a few weeks. Uh, I am hoping against hope that uh, the European Green Deal remains a focus for Europe. Uh, it disappeared because of the war. Uh, it's got to be brought back. Europe is not very good at war, but it's much better at sustainable development. Uh, this is, should be Europe's specialty. Uh, yeah. Europeans don't even know how to fight wars. That's good. I'm glad you forgot. Uh, but uh, we should have Europe as the world leader of sustainable development. And the fourth uh, point that I'll make is that um, every country and every region needs long-term plans. Uh, you cannot do this year to year. This has to be based on long-term plans. The SDGs were set for the year 
2030, but they won't be achieved by 2030. This is for sure. So really, we're looking at a time horizon to mid-century. That's why Europe talks about decarbonizing by 2050, for example. This isn't to just give permission to have the homework late. Uh, it is to say that the kind of goals we have are longer term changes. They're more fundamental. Uh, that's why your teaching process is so important. Uh, we need people to understand this and we need businesses to take long term strategies of change. That will be the only way the businesses will survive. Incidentally, I'll just mention one last point. China has become the world's low cost producer of green technologies. I watched this process uh, over the last 20 years. For 20 years, the United States debated internally, well, is climate change real? No, it's not real. Yes, it is real. No, it's not real. Uh, the US debated, should we go to electric vehicles? Ah, yes, no. No, we're gonna drive internal combustion engines uh, and so on. So the US debated, China changed. China actually sells 40% of its new cars as electric vehicles. China made a huge transformation. Because, so it, because they saw the business opportunity. They seized the business opportunity. Yes, they, they understood because they think longer term. They saw the business opportunity. Now they dominate. And now what does the U.S. and Europe say? Oh, that's unfair. They have overcapacity. They're dumping. We have to protect ourselves. We have to put up tariffs. Well, let me say, this is pathetic. Uh, you know, uh, the ones that think ahead should uh, should should uh, have their commercial success, and we should catch up. So this is, to my mind, yet yeah. another part of the story. So let me let me stop there and turn it back over to you. Sustainability, anyway, it, it's a re, it's really complicated itself. It's the biggest challenge that humanity has ever faced. And of course, geopolitics and the wars are not helping at all. But you spoke about transformation, and I would like to steer a bit the conversation towards the business sector and the corporate world. Um, more than ever, I think we need leadership for sustainability because we cannot commit to longer, long term plans and strategic development without having the board uh, uh, along, the senior management understanding all the needs. But it's kind of a bit difficult, and we are hearing more and more the discussions that sustainability is expensive, that uh, we cannot invest now. So, again, a short term um, perspective. How, how do you see the role of the senior? Senior management and the boards changing, and how can a sustainability chief officer, for example, um, have arguments to discuss with, with with the management that this is no longer to be delayed. You cannot delay your homework, even if the context seems that you can do that. Well, look, let, let me uh, come to this question by saying, uh, business cannot do this without uh, the government taking the lead on this and without providing a framework for this, uh, because the market signals by themselves are not correct. That's why there's a European trading system. That's why there's sustainable development goals. That's why there's a European Green Deal, because if we just relied on market forces alone, this would be wishful thinking. We won't get there. Uh, by the way, many uh, people are saying, yes, but China's a polluter and so forth. Yes, but it's making the transformation. That's the point. Uh, it had rapid industrial growth based on coal. Now it is decarbonizing uh, and it has set objectives and it is now the low cost producer of all of the zero carbon technologies. And that's why its transformation will go quite quickly. Uh, we need to decide in our own societies that we're making those transformations uh, and, uh, and, and actually then take the measures, the policy steps, the regulations, the clear timelines to achieve these. What I would say to business is uh, it's very hard for business to be ahead of government. So uh, this is one point. But I think the example with China really shows you don't want your government to uh, delay 
uh, procrastinate, uh, say it's not true, uh, in the end, <laughs> you'll just lose. The Germans were very bad at this. Uh, the Germans uh, really denied electric vehicles for a long time. Uh, in Europe, the German auto industry is uh, absolutely a paramount industry. Uh, but the Germans invented the internal combustion engine in the 1880s. Uh, but 150 years later, the internal combustion engine can't function. So uh, we needed Volkswagen and, uh, and uh, uh, Daimler-Benz and, and uh, Mercedes and others to uh, lead the transformation. They did not do so. Now they're asking for protectionism against BYD uh, and Chinese companies and, and complaining about Chinese overcapacity. This is our failure. Uh, so, and by the way, it will have a huge impact because Europe's economy has succeeded in uh, by, ex by exporting the automobiles to China. That's not going to occur anymore uh, the way we're going. Uh, you know, maybe uh, Europe can protect its own market and the U.S. can protect its own market, but protectionism isn't going to give prosperity. So for prosperity, we have to be competitive. Uh, we have to be able to export, whether to China or to uh, the emerging economy markets, which will be the dynamic markets in the world. Protectionism will not save us in that way because we'll lose the China market, we'll lose the emerging economy market. And so all of this is to say that I mean, my, my message to the business community is just understand this agenda is real. It's not going away. The environmental crises are real. They're serious. They're becoming more intense. So one way or another, business is going to have to transform. Doing it late doesn't save anything. It loses the whole market. Uh, it loses the market domestically unless the market is then protected against international law. Uh, it loses, or I should say, international trading uh, standards. Uh, it loses the foreign markets to loss of competitiveness. So in the executive suite, no question that the board and the CEO should be asking, how does this agenda affect our business? How does it affect our product lines? Are our products vulnerable to uh, being essentially uh, 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 made uh, uncompetitive or inappropriate? How does it affect our production systems? Uh, how does it affect our supply chains? Uh, how does it affect our customer use? So these are the questions that businesses need to ask. Maybe some businesses will say, well, it doesn't really affect us at all. We use electricity and we hope it's produced green, but we don't do much of anything else. Or the business could say, we're in a line of business, uh, internal combustion engine vehicles that is really in trouble. What do we do about that? Or we're involved in shipping uh, in the Black Sea region this has to go electric. Are we on top of the technology game? Or we are in the food or agriculture sector. Uh, where are our inputs coming from? What about our uh, pollutants? What about our production processes? Uh, how is this going? What about our uh, global value chains? Uh, all of this is going to change. And in the US, the business has said, nah, it's not really going to change. We don't believe in this and Congress is protecting us and so forth. But now the whole international competitiveness environment is changing rather dramatically. Uh, so being last to the game is not really much help. Um, you spoke about the uh, regulations. You spoke, you spoke about the government. It's Okay, it's crucial, no doubt, and sustainability, it's a team effort, and it's a journey, uh, uh, ongoing journey, I would say. Um, I'm curious to see if you are advocating for the 
carrot or the stick approach because we had voluntary reporting since many years now and unfortunately the companies didn't move the needle so much because it was voluntary now we have mandatory we have regulations we might have fines and we are seeing a discussion that csrd is a burden for companies but how can we move our agenda so i think we need both the carrot and both the stick penalties and incentives we don't see it in romania but I think they will come later on. But I'm curious to see your uh, your point of view on the topic. I, I think that the the main point is to have a coherent long-term plan, first of all, uh, to know at the level of uh, the cities or at the level of the country or at the level of uh, Europe or the level of the sub-region, where are we going in critical areas, transport, uh, fiber, um, power generation and distribution, uh, electrification of transport. We need uh, a framework for business to operate. Uh, also, of course, it would be nice if there are some highly innovative businesses uh, that uh, really uh, are getting ahead by the, on the basis of uh, trying to be at the cutting edge of all of this and entering the European or the Middle East market uh, or the Black Sea region market uh, by being uh, the, the, the innovators in this area because those who truly innovate make, make a lot of money uh, out of uh, being in, in the lead. If you have a coherent framework, both carrots and sticks can work. The problem with carrots is uh, someone has to uh, pay for the carrots and, and uh, uh, someone has to provide uh, the means of the incentives. The US, for example, because we don't have much of a political consensus in the US, is all on the carrot side uh, because uh, any direct regulation has been blocked by the lobbyists. So the only thing our Congress can agree on is subsidies or tax credits. <laughs> the problem with that is that we end up with huge budget deficits uh, that uh, can't be paid for. Um, and our debt is growing very fast. So if it's an all carrots approach, governments can't afford it. Uh, and and uh, that means that some kind of balance of carrots and sticks within a sound uh, budget framework is essential and both need to be used. Uh, governments, I mean, businesses need to be told after a certain date, you won't be able to sell X, Y, and Z on the market anymore. Uh, so I'm in favor of that kind of regulatory approach. But the problem is there's pushback in Europe. There's pushback in Europe because there's so much instability right now. Uh, there's a lot of instability because from one year to the next, the energy system uh, it was uh, broken uh, with the end of uh, gas from Russia, uh, the arrival of uh, five times more expensive liquefied natural gas from the U.S. This is uh, very disruptive. Now the farmers are on strike, uh, everyone's on strike. Uh, so uh, that's why it looks so hard because no one's satisfied with the, uh, with the situation as it is. Um, I have one question received prior to the webinar from one of the participants, and I saw a question in the chat that I will address a little uh, later. I want to talk about money, <laughs> about yeah. the sustainable finance, because it's very important. So regulation is one of the levers, and definitely the money are maybe the most important lever, especially from a let's say, private sector point of view. And I have two questions received from Carmistin is the third largest poultry meat producer from Romania. And uh, the, the two questions are the following. What do you think is the most pressing failure of the current financial system and its long-term impact on business and environment? So how did the, why did the, 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 the system fail? And in the same time, what do you think are the main actions in order to facilitate the transition towards sustainable finance? We know that banks are in the first line of advancing the sustainability agenda, and the discussion is not a very, not at all an easy one in Romania. I believe it's all over the world. So yeah, well, it, you know, there there are many uh, many issues with with finance. Uh, one issue is that uh, 
the banking system continued to finance fossil fuels at a very large scale. So this is just a, a basic point, which is that um, we are still allocating a lot of uh, the flow of new investments to completely unsustainable technologies. Again, I would call that probably more a, uh, a policy failure than a banking failure per se. The banks are looking at profitable investments. They continue to invest in fossil fuel production because our governments don't have coherent long-term energy programs that are clear, explained, and being implemented very well. Uh, Europe uh, makes a little bit of progress, but after the outbreak of the war, it's complete incoherence, I would say, in, in terms of uh, the energy situation right now. Coal is being brought back to use. Lignite is being brought back to use. There's no agreement on uh, the role of uh, nuclear power in Europe. Um, this is what makes things very, very hard. Uh, the Greens in, in Germany shut down nuclear, uh, and then they brought back coal. That makes no sense. It's uh, just a short-term compromise. I'm sorry? That it, uh, bringing back coal, it was uh, presented like a short-term compromise. We need that because we cannot do it otherwise for the next winter. So. Yeah, but, you know, there's no plans. There's no <laughs> framework. Uh, they don't talk about what happens after the short term. Uh, completely incoherent. Uh, and this is very different, again, from, from places that are able to uh, have a systematic plan. Uh, there's no clarity about what's going to happen in, in your region or in the Balkans. What about the Western Balkans? How does it fit into uh, the European energy system? How does the Middle East fit into the European energy system? How does North Africa fit into the European energy system? The politicians don't want to discuss these things. They say to the 27 countries, make your own plans. But Europe needs a, an integrated plan, not 27 separate national plans. So th these are, I think, I don't, you can tell, I don't like politicians very much. Uh, I want them to do their job better than they do. Uh, and, uh, and, and I don't think uh, in most of the cases uh, they're doing their job adequately. We have a question in the chat regarding the nuclear energy because you've mentioned it several yeah. times. The question is if nuclear energy is a clean energy source that is worth the associated environmental risks? I because... think so in general. Okay. Yeah, I, I think so. Uh, you know, uh, again, uh, it depends if there are some places that are so sunny or so windy uh, that they have or such a, a large amount of hydropower that they have uh, good low-cost base load alternatives. Uh, there are some places that don't have that uh, in which and as long as uh, you're not on a, uh, on a uh, seismic fault uh, and it's uh, not a highly dangerous region uh, and now with more advanced safety mm -hmm. systems I think nuclear is surely going to play mm -hmm. a continuing role. Uh, this is obviously true in Asia, but it's uh, also true in parts of Europe. There's no question about it. Um, so I think that nuclear is part of the mix. And again, uh, if uh, somebody says, no, I'm against nuclear, at least say, what is your, what is your scenario? Give the quantification of it. Show the pathway. Here's the alternatives. This one's more expensive, but it doesn't have the nuclear waste issue uh, or whatever. Uh, so those are valid points, but at least show the alternatives systematically. Yes, uh, offer an option in the same time. And of yes. course, it's not a one size fits all. It depends every much on the specificity of the country, of the region. It's not nuclear, maybe it's not the, 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 the solution for anyone. You have to explore a bit and to see what are the, uh, the best options to, to, to implement.
We have one I, 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 I see a question in the chat yes, about yes. Uh, the, ne the neoliberal shock therapy. Yes, uh, since, uh, since I'm associated with that, I'd like to say a word about that. Please do that. I was yes. about to, to read Anka's question, but please address yeah, it. Which is that the whole thing is uh, a, a little bit uh, wrong. Uh, what, what I recommended was that uh, Romania, Bulgaria, uh, Hungary, Czech Republic, uh, Slovakia, and so forth, be quickly incorporated into Europe. That was my recommendation. Uh, that was not neoliberal, uh, blah, 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 uh, because Europe is not neoliberal, uh, or shouldn't be. Europe is uh, basically social democratic. Uh, everywhere, uh, government spending is around 40% of GDP, healthcare is for free, education is for free, uh, and the whole idea that I had was that uh, what was then the European community and is now the European Union uh, would have uh, structural funding for building infrastructure and for building the connections between, uh, between uh, uh, Western Europe and Central and Eastern Europe. And the idea was right and the idea led to uh, believe me, Romania in 1993 was not in great shape. I was there. Uh, Bucharest uh, was not exactly a booming uh, metropolis. Um, and uh, the same thing was true in uh, Warsaw, and the same thing was true in Prague, and the same thing was true uh, across Central and Eastern Europe. So the idea was to reconnect the continent and also for Europe and the United States to help pay for that. Where the US and Europe helped to pay for that, progress was very good. In general, uh, for most countries, uh, for Poland, for example, where I helped write the first plan, uh, Poland was at about one third of the German income level per capita in 1989. Now it's at about 70% of the German per capita income level. That's good. Uh, over a, a period of uh, a little over 30 years, that's a lot of rapid progress. Uh, but the idea was never so-called neoliberal, at least not my idea. I'm a social democrat uh, through and through, always was, uh, and still remain till today, uh, meaning a rather large government with about uh, 40 to 50 percent of GDP collected in taxes and spent uh, on public investment and public services, because uh, to my mind, a small government means a high inequality uh, and a loss of uh, infrastructure and a lot of deprivation. Uh, so that, to my mind, I just wanted to clarify. Uh, do we need centralized initiatives? Yes, we do. Absolutely. Uh, you know, the problem in Eastern Europe and Central Europe under the Soviet uh, era was that it was 100% centralized. Uh, the neoliberal idea is 100% uh, decentralized. All extremes are wrong in life. Uh, we need something in the middle. Uh, this is uh, the, the basic point. Uh, Claudia, I see that you have your hand raised, please. Yes, uh, I have two questions. First is, uh, if United Nations uh, is still capable to meet their role, if United Nations is an institution that works, because we are not on track with the SDGs, as you said, we have a lot of words, and words uh, probably are more polluted than maybe oil and gas. Uh, and we know from history that the League of Nations uh, didn't work. So this is my question. Uh, yeah. In our in today, is United Nations an uh, institution that work for a, a peaceful and sustainable world? So the, the UN uh, is the best we have, but it doesn't work. Uh, it doesn't work because uh, it doesn't have uh, independent finances. Those depend on the member states. The U.S. doesn't pay its bills. Uh, so this is even the, the U.N. can't keep uh, the lights on uh, in uh, U.N. Uh, agencies right now because the U.S. is behind in paying its bills. Second, the, the U.N. does not have power to enforce peace because the veto of 
uh, the major powers. So if uh, the U.S., <laughs> Europe, uh, U.S., Russia, and China are not cooperating, the U.N. can't function. Uh, so this is uh, just like the problem with the League of Nations, again. Uh, we're trying to make international law, but we still have great power politics. And uh, this is, uh, I think, uh, a very difficult challenge. Uh, I think it's the biggest uh, challenge we face, which is uh, great power politics ends up uh, leading to great wars. Uh, we need uh, instead uh, international law, uh, the UN Charter, true multilateralism. But that requires that the great powers step back and give up some of their power to international law. And uh, great powers don't like to act in that way. So to my mind, the lack of financing and the lack of authority or the veto by the great powers are the two biggest obstacles to the UN actually doing its job. On the first, this financing issue, I recommend having a set of international taxes where taxing international shipping or aviation or financial transactions uh, or carbon emissions goes straight to the pot of the global community, straight to the UN, rather than through the nation states, so that the US or others can't block the financing for the global institutions. So this is uh, one recommendation. On the uh, second, on the war and peace issue, I recommend that the UN Security Council should be able to override the veto of uh, a uh, one of the permanent members, say by a vote of uh, uh, 10 or 11 of the countries. We just had a vote, for example, of whether Palestine should be admitted as a UN member state. Uh, the vote was uh, 12 in favor, one veto, the US, and two abstentions. So the US blocks uh, what the rest of the world wants. When it went to the General Assembly, the vote was 142 countries in favor and nine opposed. Israel uh, and uh, the US, uh, Czech Republic, Hungary, Argentina, Paraguay, uh, Papua New Guinea, Palau, uh, and uh, Nauru. <laughs> okay, you know, 142 in favor uh, is a huge majority, but the U.S. has a veto power. So this is why the U.N. doesn't work. And many people in the U.S., oh, they hate the U.N., by the way, uh, because they say, you know, we're a great power. Why should we be limited uh, by the U.N.? But this is exactly the problem that we're trying to solve in the world, that we shouldn't have great powers that do what they want. Um, regarding big structures, um, I would have one question regarding uh, Romania joining the OECD. Uh, we talk about a milestone that is considered to be, let's say, a strategic counting project after uh, just like entering the, the EU and NATO were some years ago. Can you please explain us briefly what this means from a corporate sustainability point of view? What should companies expect uh, and why not also public authorities and regulators? I'm sorry, could you, could you say at the beginning again, what is, say one more time, I, I so, missed the... Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm asking about what is the impact from a corporate sustainability point of view that Romania is becoming a full member of the OECD. Oh, we are, I see. we are talking about the economic benefits, great, yeah. but what about accountability and transparency? Well, you know, the, the OECD is a very valuable institution, uh, so it's, it's very good. I didn't follow that, uh, that uh, Romania is joining, but that's a very good sign. You know, the, the, what the OECD is, uh, is uh, the, the club of uh, the high-performing countries. Um, and one of the useful things the OECD does is make comparisons and set standards of high performance. Um, 
so I'm, I'm in favor of the OECD. I, I think it's a good institution. It does lots of things. It makes detailed normative standards. It does lots of comparative uh, analysis. It doesn't change your life in any fundamental way because it's uh, mostly an analytical organization, uh, a peer review organization, and to some extent, a standard setting organization, especially among the uh, high income uh, democracies. Um, so I find it useful, not decisive, but useful. Uh, anyway, it's a good sign for Romania. Uh, I, I think uh, it will just make this agenda that we're talking about uh, even more central because there will be dimensions of the OECD agenda around the sustainability uh, agenda. And by the way, what, one of the things of international organizations is that they at least expose the problems better than our national politics. In the U.S., we don't talk about sustainable development at the federal level at all. Uh, they don't even recognize the sustainable development goals, uh, which, again, you may not want to hear it, but I think my country's profoundly messed up. Uh, but in, in any event, um, they can't stop the UN from talking about it. And the OECD is similar. The OECD absolutely will be carrying the agenda of sustainability. So being part of the OECD will mean more attention to these issues. Uh, and uh, that, to my mind, is all to the good. Uh, there will be more discussions, more standards, more benchmarking, uh, more planning than there otherwise would be. And more demanding for data and for planning. And, and absolutely. <laughs> a absolutely. Okay. So I, I, I have to go, but I, I just want to say to uh, people, especially in the chat, people are saying same old problems, should we give up and so forth. You know, Life is not so easy, as you know very well. Uh, history is not linear. Uh, we don't achieve all that we have uh, set out to achieve, uh, quite, quite the contrary. The issue isn't whether things are working. The issue is whether this agenda is important or superfluous. Uh, and that's the only real issue in my mind. Uh, is the issue of sustainable development a valid issue or is it just a fad? Uh, is it just something to be nice and to check the box or is it something important? I can only tell you uh, after 40 years of work on this and reflection on it, this is real and serious. It's more serious than the war. It's more serious than uh, our urgent issues. It's real. It's deep. It's not going away. Uh, so in this sense, it makes no sense to say, should we give up on it? Uh, is it hopeless? Uh, and so on. Same thing with the UN. I have worked 25 years for the UN on a, on a dollar a year basis. I'm a volunteer, but I've been a senior advisor at the UN for a quarter century. No one has to lecture me about the limitations of the UN. Why do I do it? Well, not because it's so much fun compared to other things I could be doing, but because I believe we need to make these institutions work because they're really important. Uh, I testified twice in the UN Security Council in the last 12 months. Uh, do I think the UN Security Council guarantees peace? Of course not. Uh, it, it, it barely functions because one country vetoes or another country vetoes. So why waste your time? because I'm not a cynic. I believe it's extremely important to make this work. And we have to keep trying and understand, by the way, when it comes to the multilateral system, we've had 100 years in our 10,000 year human civilization of trying to make this work. So we're at the very beginning of the story. The League of Nations was the first attempt. It failed completely. Uh, the UN is the second attempt. Uh, I don't want to give up on it. I think we really need to make this work because we're so interconnected and in so much danger that we need to make the multilateralism work. 
And one final message for the business leaders? Well, the business leaders, look, truly, honestly, uh, this agenda will become the dominant way of making business. There's no question. China figured that out already. It's making global business. Uh, Europe uh, needs to figure it out. It's ahead of the United States. Uh, the U.S. is still arguing about whether it's real. Uh, the sooner you get on this, the less protectionism you're going to need, uh, the less you're going to be falling behind, the less your businesses are going to be completely disrupted, and the more chance you have to take advantage of innovation and become uh, leaders in the future. So my whole point is that because this is a true deep need, definitely the world will move in this direction. Uh, as a business, responsible business, you should just understand that and analyze what these crises mean for your business and how to think about the long-term perspective. I don't think most of you are in business for the next six months or 12 months or two years. You're in business for the long term. So that's the key. Think longer term and plan ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a very insightful and uh, pleasant discussion, even with some politics. It doesn't mind. And thank you for <laughs> stressing out the importance of sustainability. It's here. It's not going to stay. And of course, we don't have to lose hope. Best of luck. Greetings from, from Romania. And thank we you so do much. hope to, to meet you again in person in Bucharest. I count All on that. Mulțumim tuturor că ați fost alături de noi și sperăm că v-a inspirat discursia de astăzi. Toate cele bune! Să ne revedem sănătoși! Numai bine!